Well, good morning once again. It is so good to be back in your midst and to see that everyone is and everything is in one piece. We did have a little problem with the Fellowship Hall AC, so hopefully we need to lay hands on air conditioners around our uh, anointed exorcisms, something. I don't know. Uh, before, before I go on, we do have one other, we have so many things happening, it's hard to keep track. Actually, in the middle of summer, what an amazing gift it is to be part of a vibrant and active congregation. This Tuesday night, most of you know, is another movie night. I don't believe we announced that. I don't think it made the bulletin. So, uh, Tuesday night, you get to experience the incredible experience of our, our new, newly renovated chapel with our movie night, Amazing Grace, the story of... Uh, uh, George Winthrop, and he was one of the early, uh, um, early pioneers in the fight against slavery, anti-slavery campaigns. It'll be a great movie time together at 7 o'clock uh, Tuesday night. We are beginning a sermon series. This is a great time to do so. For the next um, eight weeks, we're going to focus on prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer, but a little more than that. We're also going to look at a prayer by Paul, St. Paul, and by St. Peter. It's an ever-relevant thing, prayer, right? Because you, we, can never, we can never explore that topic enough. So often we feel so disconnected from God. I'm reminded of the couple. They were newly married. Wedding night. And strangely enough, it was a custom in the country. Uh, for the bride and groom to spend their first wedding night in the bride's parents' home. Little different, but they did. And so they're married there in her bedroom that she grew up in. And she says to her husband, who was not very religious, but she was, she said, well, we're going to pray before we go to bed. And he said, not me. I don't know how to pray. She said, well, uh, you're going to learn tonight. And so they did. Next morning, they all gathered with the whole family at breakfast. And uh, he said, I did something last night I never did before. <laughs> there was an awkward silence in the room. And then she, his wife, said to him in front of all of them, Yes, and if you're not good today, I'll tell everybody how awkward you were in doing it. <laughs> Prayer. Why is it? I guarantee you that if I asked you to scale this steeple or to pray publicly, most of you would choose to scale the steeple. Why is it so hard for us to pray? N not only publicly, but personally. It's so difficult. And so Jesus knows who we are knows our need, and he gives us a prayer that's a template for learning how to pray. He's teaching us through the Lord's Prayer, and it's such a gift for us. Now, the section just before the Lord's Prayer, Jesus sets it up, and he says, don't be like the hypocr hypocrite pagans who like to go in public and be flashy with their prayers. The word hypocrite, it, 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 the Greek word really has to do with being a play actor. Uh, the, the Greek word has to do with a, 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 one of those, you know, those thespian masks? That's what it kind of is an allusion to. In other words, don't fake it. Be real. Be you. You don't have to pray like Billy Graham. You don't have to be like anyone else. It doesn't have to be awkward. And so Jesus is teaching us. Now here's the problem for us. And I speak for myself. And this part of the, when I preach, I'm preaching to myself first. And, and I'm hoping that part of what I'm gleaning from what God is teaching us through his word is also helpful for you. Being a church person, we say the Lord's Prayer every week in one form or fashion. That's good, but it's also a problem. You know why? Because whenever you do something so regularly, it can become kind of rote and mechanical. And you do it without thinking about it. You do it without it really seeping into the pores of your soul. My hope is that as we study the Lord's Prayer, take it clause by clause, it will be an awakening, an epiphany for you. I heard an interesting story. One of my favorite bands, this is, most of you may not know this band, it's a, it's a rock band, actually a grunge band called Pearl Jam. 
I know Pearl Jam? Pearl Jam's a great band. Yeah, I know Don knows them. Don was in the rock industry, so he knows all about Pearl. He probably knows Eddie Vedder. And you may know this story, Don. Eddie Vedder wrote a song. Now, let me give you a backdrop with grunge music, which comes out of Seattle. It's sort of garage music. It's kind of dark music. It's kind of depressing. They're really into kind of the underbelly of life, and it's real. It's very real. Eddie Vedder wrote a song. It's a really popular song, a big hit for the group Pearl Jam called Alive. And in the song, there's this refrain again and again. He says, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. And it's really singable. And the, whenever he's in concert, the whole audience, thousands of people are singing it with him. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. Now, here's the interesting thing about that song. When Eddie Vedder wrote it, he was depressed. Depressed over the fact that he was alive. He was singing it tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, I'm still alive. Darn it. I'm still alive. At some point in the middle of a concert, at some point in their life cycle as a band, Eddie is singing this with that kind of orientation, really not happy to be alive. And the whole audience was singing it back to him. And he had an epiphany. And the meaning of that song changed automatically for him. And he realized, they're alive. I'm alive. And I need to be grateful. The same words. The lyrics didn't change. The same words. But there was an epiphany. The meaning completely changed. That is what Jesus wants for you and me with the Lord's Prayer. Whatever you think you know... Let him make it come alive in a new way as we study it these coming weeks. Because it's rich. It is rich for each and every one of us and for us corporately. So, with that as an introduction to the sermon series, Praying Like Jesus, Paul, and Peter, hear the Lord's Prayer. And specifically, we're going to focus on the preface to the Lord's Prayer and what Jesus is teaching us before we even get into the prayer itself beginning in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew with verse 7. Again, Jesus is speaking to you. and He says this, When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And that's the key verse for us. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And Jesus says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Jesus, you give us this prayer as a gift, and we ask that it would indeed come alive for us, just as that song came alive for Eddie Vedder that night on stage. May you take the stage here for us. Teach us. Love us. Call us to yourself. And make us come alive in you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we were, uh, we were praying for you guys when we saw Hurricane Arthur starting to heat up. And uh, I, I sent out T-mail. Some of you, hopefully you get my T-mail email. And, and I think it's interesting, and part of what I said in my email went to so many of our snowbirds up north. I think it's actually because of the, the weather changes we're seeing. It's becoming more dangerous during hurricane season to live up there than it is down here. I mean, it starts out down here, but then they really get it up there. But uh, we were praying for you nonetheless, and we're, we're here to ride it out with you if any more come. I was thinking about Hurricane Arthur and hurricanes, and hurricane season, we're right in the middle of it, right? And I was digging through some, some stuff. I have this old article. It's interesting, some of the things preachers keep around. It's an article from 2005, September 3rd. Remember what happened then? Hurricane Katrina. We, I need not say much more to describe the hell that happened in New Orleans 
at Hurricane Katrina. It shocked our country. It shocked the world. How horrible it was. And, and I, wish I, had, I wish I had a big screen. I could show you this on a slide because it's an article here. And it has a woman. And just try to go back and remember the news scenes. And the people screaming for help. And this woman, her name is Angelina. And she's on her knees with her eyes just clenched shut, screaming with her hands in a prayer posture. And this is how the article, well, the title of the article is, New Orleans, a hellish scene as civility crumbles. And this is how the article begins. Above the den, a woman is screaming the Lord's Prayer as if heaven no longer hears silent pleas. Oh, what a way to start out. And what a commentary when you are feeling like you're in a kind of hell. That God doesn't hear you. That God has no idea. They felt that way. I mean, we can flash back to get a feel for what they must have been feeling like. God had abandoned them. God doesn't know. God doesn't hear. Have you ever felt like that? I mean, maybe you've been in situations where you, you just feel like God, God has no clue. God is absent. God doesn't know, doesn't hear. But that's why what Jesus begins with in his preface to the Lord's Prayer is so very important as a foundation for understanding prayer. And it's important for us to understand this kind of thing now before you get into those situations. Because when you're in those situations, you're reaching into the bank, the spiritual bank of what you've already been nurtured on. That's why this is so important. And so Jesus teaches that God already knows before you even say anything. Before you know, God knows. It's this big 75-cent theological word called omniscience, which means that God is all-knowing. We're going to unpack that a little bit because that is the implications for it are huge for how we pray and for how prayer and specifically the Lord's Prayer shapes our lives. So, because God is all-knowing, and by the way, if you're a note-taker, I've got several points here that you might find very pithy and helpful. I encourage you to write them down. And here's the first one, the implication, the good news, the benefit for God being omniscient or all-knowing as we approach God in prayer. Here's the very first thing. Because God is all-knowing, that means he walks with us in our pain. And that may seem a little counterintuitive at first, but let me reference for you the third chapter of Genesis. Remember what's happening in the third chapter of Genesis? The serpent comes to Eve and he says, hey, psst, 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 over here, there's a tree, there's some good fruit there. Have a bite, because if you do, this is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will know everything that God knows. Now, she didn't think very hard about it. She didn't read the footnote, the fine print, because what happens, what's the shift there? Beginning of Genesis, they create everything, they name everything with God, and everything is good, right? Track with me here. Everything's good. In other words, Adam and Eve know nothing but goodness, nothing but God's love, perfection. They know what's good. They know what's really good. The shift is that she will know, and then eventually Adam will know, not just what's good. See, that's what God wanted us, just to know what's good. The shift is, okay, now you're going to really know what God knows. You're going to know evil, too. You're going to know pain. You're going to know labor. You're going to know loss. You're going to know these things that I didn't design you to know. You want to be like me? I'm a big boy. I know pain. And so God, in essence, says through this whole deal of bringing sin into our lives, all right, I'm going to give you an experience of what it's like, an experience, not a whole experience, an experience of what it's like to be God. You're going to know pain. I know pain. And so, uh, you're human, I'll give you just your pain. And you just your pain. And you just your pain. Because you can't handle more than that. I know all of your pain and all the pain of everyone who ever existed and ever will exist as if it's my own. We have a God. We have a God who says, you know, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you in on this. And it's not fun. But I'm not going to abandon you. And so my favorite theologian, Karl Barth, has this wonderful phrase. He says, God would rather share the suffering of human wretchedness than to be the blessed God of unblessed creatures. So God lets us in at our insistence on his pain, on knowing that. And he walks with us in it. Which really brings us to the second point of God being an all-knowing God. Not only does God walk with us in pain, but God is the God with us. Emmanuel, as Isaiah puts it, God with us. You know that classic poetic verse in the first chapter of John. P perhaps my favorite chapter of any book in the Bible. It's so beautiful. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Talking about Jesus, of course. It's this idea that God meets us where we are. Like a flash of light coming into our lives. I'm reminded of the story of the little boy who was with his, he spent the night with his grandparents. And a thunderstorm arose. He went to the window to look out the window. And at that moment, a flash of lightning struck. He ran downstairs and said, Grandpa, Grandpa, you'll never guess what just happened. He said, what happened? He said, God just took my picture. <laughs> what happens when you take a picture? Think about that. When you're looking through the viewfinder, you're intensely focused on that object that you're trying to focus on. That's all you see. God sees you that way. That's how close God is with you. God is with us. That's the other benefit of God being all-knowing. God, God walks with us in our pain, and God is always with us, never abandoning us, always active in our midst. In fact, we don't know most of the time how God is active in our midst. God is the one that led you here. I believe that you didn't wake up this morning, and I didn't wake up this morning and think, I just want to go to church. It was the prompting of the Holy Spirit that got you here. Why is it that we baptize infants in our tradition? Does it say something about the child making a statement of faith? Absolutely not. It says everything about what God is doing before a child ever has the opportunity or ability to make any kind of claim of faith for Jesus Christ. It's about God's activity initiating first with you and me and everyone. God with us. That's the second point. Another benefit, a third benefit of God being an all-knowing God is this. He is able to care about the details of our lives. You know that classic text where Jesus is teaching in the 12th chapter of Luke. And he says, consider the lilies of the field. Remember that text? They do not labor or spin. I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And then you can turn over to Hebrews and see where the writer of Hebrews teaches that Jesus sympathizes with us in our weakness. He knows us so well. But that's hard on the ground level to grasp sometimes. I mean, you and I always feel at one point or another, like, really? Is God that close? Where is God? I don't get it. And that's when, if you can't see God, obviously, you trust God's heart. As Charles Spurgeon said, when you can't trace God's hand, trust God's heart. In the Lord's Prayer, we see God's heart. You and I will not be able to see God, feel God, 100% of the time, in and above all circumstances of our lives. But we can, 100% of the time, regardless of what's swirling around in our lives, we can trust God's heart. That's what the Lord's Prayer is about, seeing God's heart. And then a final point, a final benefit of God being an all-knowing God. All this is before we even get to the prayer. Isn't that a wonderful thing that Jesus gives us this gift? Not only 
does he walk with us in our pain, not only is he God with us, and not only does he care about the details of our lives, but nothing slips past God. Nothing slips past God. In that same chapter of Luke, 12th chapter, he talks about counting every hair on your head. Now just, have you ever stopped to think about that? I mean, it's such an insignificant kind of detail in one sense, and yet it's very profound. That God knows us, I mean, who, who would even want to count the hairs of anyone's head? God wants to. God loves you that Knows every pore in your skin, every cell in your body. Why is it then that we so, if that's true, why is it that we so often feel like God is, we're so disconnected from God? Like God is just kind of clueless about us in our lives. I remember when I was a kid talking to my grandfather. And of course, when you're a kid, everyone seems really old, right? <laughs> And, uh, and I just remember thinking, oh, my grandfather doesn't know half of what I'm saying. Partly because he can't hear well, and partly because the lingo that I'm using, you know, I mean, he's 100 years older than me. And now, my kids speak to me. <laughs> I'm thinking, what are they saying? <laughs> and they're saying, Dad, you're just clueless. <laughs> well, a little bit. A little bit. It's a little bit like the, uh, the story in First Kings. The story of Elijah, and he challenges the priests of the Baal God, B-A-A-L, the challenge that he gives to them. And he has them do all these incantations to try and call their God, and they're going to have the war of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the God of Baal. Except that their God is not answering. So what does he do? Remember, it's really a funny kind of scene. He taunts them. And he, he says, shout louder, perhaps your gods are sleeping. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like that. We've got to shout louder like this woman on her knees right after Katrina because we feel like God's sleeping. But no, we need to know as a fact and we need to trace, if not God's hand, know God's heart, that God is not ever sleeping. Nothing gets past our God. So, if all this is true, if he walks with us in our pain, if he is God with us, if he's able to care about the details of our lives and nothing slips past God, it does beg one very important question. Why pray? Right? I mean, what's the purpose of prayer in the first place? Well, we don't pray to inform God, obviously. We're not telling God something God does not know. We also don't pray, and this is an important point, and I'm Believe me, we, I have to preach to myself about this as much as you. We don't pray to manipulate God. You see, we often use God, don't we? Like a Santa Claus or like a lucky rabbit's foot. I'm, when I was in seminary, I did an internship with a church down in Trinidad in the West Indies for three months. It was a, a very interesting, very challenging time, uh, a, a great experience down there in a different culture, very, very different Majority Hindus in that country, that island country. And the church has patterned what they call a prayer service after the Hindu puja, which is a Hindu prayer service. And so uh, my introduction to the church was, we're going to have a prayer service. Now, when you think of a prayer service, what do you think about? What, what images come to your mind? I thought, all right, we're going to get together and we're going to sit in a circle and we're going to have prayer needs and we're going to pray. No, that's not what a prayer service was in Trinidad. A prayer service meant um, this family over here just got a new car. And they want the pastor to come at, to their house and they're gonna, he's going to lead a service. It's going to include prayers. It's going to include liturgy. It's going to include hymns. It's going to include all this stuff. And there's going to be a big feast. And they're going to pray for the new car. Or a new house, or, or you know, some other more significant things like a, a, a child, or someone's going away to school, or it could be anything whatsoever. And on one hand, I kind of go back and forth the way I've always evaluated those services. On one hand, what a wonderful display of piety that they would kind of try to honor God and bring God into the mix for any and everything in their lives. And on the other hand, sometimes it felt like, hmm, this feels really like they're trying to manipulate God. And I go back and forth in my, isn't that the way we are in our prayer lives? Isn't that the way you are? Am I the only one like this, guys? We wrestle with that. 
One of my favorite books on the Lord's Prayer is a book by N.T. Wright, a wonderful New Testament scholar. It's called The Lord and His Prayer. Listen to what he says and tell me if you identify with this. He says, how do you set about praying? From our point of view, there is a fairly obvious order of priorities. We're usually in some sort of mess and we want, to, want God to get us out of it. Anybody identify with that? Then, we've usually got some fairly pressing needs and we want God to supply them. It may strike us at that point that there's a larger world out there beyond our own needs, our wants, our world. Again, we probably move from mess to wants, looking at a global scale. Please sort out the Middle East, God. Please feed the hungry. Please house the homeless. But then, once more, it may dawn on us that there's not just a larger world out there. There's a larger God out there. There's a bigger God out there. He's not just a celestial cleaner up and sorter out of our mess and our wants. He is God. He is the living God. He is our Father. And if we linger here, we may find our priorities quietly turned inside out. I want you to think about that. I'm going to ask Mark to come forward and to share a song with you. So it's one of my favorite songs. It's a song called My Glorious. I want you to listen to the words. Listen to the lyrics. Because it's exactly what Jesus is wanting to do for us to open us up to a much bigger God than we often experience. Bigger than the air I breathe, the world will leave my glorious, my glorious. I mean, Jesus is wanting us to get in touch with this God. Now, I asked a question a minute ago that I have yet to answer. Why pray? After all that I've said, after all that Jesus is teaching us, why pray? There are four distinct answers I want to give to you to that question. And the first one has everything to do with that song. We pray 
to seek God's presence and power so that we can experience God's presence and power. All too often, we live by our own presence and our own power, and we're not tapping into the gift that God has for us to be aware of his presence and power. I'm reminded of the old story. The Jews have these sort of mythic stories that they would share, and one has to do with a guy named Rabbi Simeon. Rabbi Simeon was a very pious rabbi, always studying God's word, and he happened to be in this little village where he was giving a blessing for a newborn child after performing a circumcision. And he pronounced this blessing that the child would grow up to have a long life and productive and so on and so forth and sort of went through the ceremony, left the village, was walking out of town and met a stranger on the road. The stranger had a hood on and was a very dark looking figure. And so the rabbi asked him, who may I ask are you? The stranger laughed, said, I'm the angel of death. The rabbi said to him, what have you to do with me? Why are you coming this way? And he laughed again and he said, well, it's so funny that you blessed this child for a long life, but I have this decree in my hand that this very night I am given control to take that child's life. The rabbi looked at him and said, well, what control do you have over me? When is the end of my life? To which the angel of death said, well, you are a very pious man. You are always in God's word, always praying, always in touch with God's power, and so I have no control over you. I do not know the end of your life. To which the rabbi looked the angel of death in the face and said, May it be God's will that just as you have no control over my destiny, you will lose control over that innocent child's life. And as the story goes, the angel of death did lose control. And that child lived to have a long and happy life. Again, we don't manipulate God. God is not a lucky charm, but we forfeit being in touch with the power and the presence of God on a daily basis. We leave so much of that experience of God out of our lives and substitute it with so much of what we think we want and need. There's an ancient rabbinic saying that goes like this, he who prays within his house surrounds it with a wall that is stronger than iron. Don't you want that? That's the potential. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go well. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a life without problems, but it does mean that regardless of what's going on in your life, you know God's power and presence. Isn't that a better way to go through the difficulties of life? That's what Jesus is offering us and teaching us. The second reason that we pray is this, to build intimacy with God. Jesus said, go into your closet and pray. Not as an image of having private, a private God, a private experience, but of having a personal experience. There's a difference. We experience God together and personally. And we're invited into that so that we always know, because we have this closeness with God, we always are secure in God's heart, in God's goodness, regardless of what goes on. Psychologists talk about how children, when children are developing at a very young age, it's very important that they have some detach, healthy detachment from their parents. You ever seen kids that you know, just cling to their parents and won't let them go? Psychologists say that ch- children need to be alone in the presence of their parents as opposed to always clinging to their parents. There's something healthy about that. Mom's over there, dad's over there, and I'm okay here. I'm alone in the presence of the parents. You see that? That's the image for us. Insecure clinging versus secure ease. Spiritually mature people have a secure ease with God, even if you feel like God is absent. Even if you feel like, I don't know where God is right now. Because you've developed intimacy along the way. People that feel abandoned by God easily and often have, they need to cling to God. They've not developed spiritually in that way. That's the opportunity in prayer to develop that kind of intimacy. So that when we do not see God, obviously, in our lives, 
When we can't touch God, we don't feel abandoned by God. And here's the third reason that we pray. Not only to seek His presence and power and intimacy with God, but also to submit to Him as Lord and giver of life. Now that's a very unpopular word. I try to think of synonyms. That's another word you could use for submit. I don't know. But if He is the Lord of life, why would we not submit to Him? If He is the God who created you in love, who redeemed you through death, who gives you new life through His new life, we're not submitting to a tyrant, but someone who has your absolute best interest in mind. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, God, who needs nothing, loves into existence wholly superfluous creatures in order that He may love and perfect them. Why do you exist? You exist so that God might love and perfect you. That happens in the context of being connected to God's power and presence in an intimate relationship with God. And so we submit to that God, not a tyrant. And finally, the final point I want to make for you, the reason we pray is to align our will with God's will, not vice versa. We often want to pray for God's will to be our will. Think about this. God knows what we should ask better than we do, right? And so, petitioning for His will is how we petition for our needs. Asking for God's will is how we learn our needs. There's a wonderful story. A guy uh, finished tucking his daughter into bed. They said prayers, whatnot. And he left her to go to sleep, but he checked in about an hour and a half later that night and found that she was still awake. And she was kind of talking to herself. And so he checked in with her. He said, honey, wh wh what's wrong? Why are you not asleep? And she said, well, daddy, I was just thinking. This is a little tiny girl. And she said, I was thinking about my wedding day. <laughs> of course, <laughs> wedding day? Well, what are you thinking about? And she said, well, daddy, I was just thinking, you know, I'm going to be a bride and I'm going to have a gown. And it's going to be this aisle and all this stuff. And you are going to be my prince, daddy. And he said, well, honey, I understand what you mean, but I can't really be your prince. You see, I'm already mommy's prince, and society kind of frowns on me being your prince. And so he began to describe to her that you know, there's going to be another prince one day. And, you know, we don't know who he's going to be. It could be Johnny, or it could be Bobby, your friends at school, or maybe someone that you don't know yet. And she said, well, how will I know who my prince will be, Daddy? And he said, well, you don't know, but... The wisest thing, sweetie, is to let Daddy choose who your prince will be. <laughs> he said, don't do anything prince-wise without checking with Daddy first. <laughs> yeah. We pray in order to check with Daddy first. Because it's just not wise to do otherwise. Let's dive into this, guys, the next several weeks. Let's let Jesus teach us. Let's let Paul and Peter teach us. And let it open our eyes to come alive like never before. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much that you know our needs, you know us, you know us. And we are so grateful for your knowledge of us. Meet us where we are. Take us where you want us to be in our prayer life, as individuals, and as your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go to the Lord in prayer, please. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. You alone are holy and righteous. You judge and rule the world in righteousness, yet your mercy saves us. Through your mercy and steadfast love, you extend to us an eternal home with you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you, and we respond to you, embracing you as Lord God, Savior, Teacher, Friend, the one who loves us, and so we love you as you teach us how to love you and each other. Hear our prayers this morning, Lord, for our brothers and sisters. We lift up to those to you who need your healing. Norman Lay, 
who still is in rehabilitation, Lord, for a stroke, Jim Nordyke, who is now in intensive care, Mary Lane, for Michael, I'm sorry, Lord, Michael Bohateretz, Michael broke his ankle during a soccer game, and we pray for healing for him. For Jean Weaver this morning, who fell and broke her jaw, Lord, we pray for, uh, for Nancy Smith. Um, Lord, we pray for Skip, who is Ann Spang's son. He has a return of cancer and is undergoing a different chemo treatment. Father, we continue to pray for each other. We pray for Erica and John Garwood. We pray for uh, continued prayers, and we pray, Lord, that you'd heal them, heal their hearts, heal their grief, Lord. Father, we pray also for the families of those who care for our sick. We pray, Lord, for safety for those who were sent to protect others. Bless our church, Lord. Bless our members and our ministry. We thank you, Lord, for Barbara and Ken here in our presence that are here safe with us this morning. We continue to pray for their ministry. We pray, Lord, for those who don't know you and love you, the homeless, even our enemies and your enemies, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for all our physical blessings, our families, our friends, our church. As we come together to worship you, may we inspire each other to have hearts full of gratitude, even in times of sickness and trials and those of grief. Bless us now as we say together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.